So this is Simon Shadwick. Um, Simon is known to people in this area and in Central Scotland particularly as a very fine player of the um, Gaelic harp, and he'll be giving you another lecture in a short while in the semester um, on the Gaelic harp. Uh, Simon's done a lot of historical research on um, the, 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 the art music that was associated with that instrument as well as being able to play it. Um, so he's very interested in the way in which these instruments like the harp, uh, the lute, um, operated across repertoires. They feature often today in what you might think of as folk repertoire, but in fact, the lute far enough back we're finding them really positioned in, in aristocratic or even royal circles. So your lecture today is on the 17th century and on aristocratic noble gentry and musician music making and the way in which these people created repertoires for themselves and using a range of influences and providing evidence as well for these repertoires and this music making in the 17th century. Um, and so I've got some very, very fine looking pictures for you to look at as well. The, um, part, the handouts for this lecture um, are available on MMS and um, they've just been loaded up this morning, so you'll be able to go back and um, access those once you're back at your own comfortable workspaces later on today. So they are available um, loaded up this morning um, once, and they're just basically PDF prints of the PowerPoint, so that you'll get all of that. Um, through MMS, the usual route. Right, Simon, I shall have this to you. <coughs> yeah, sorry the handouts weren't prepared long in advance. I've still been fiddling with them yesterday. Um, there's, there's extra stuff as well that you should get. There's a bibliography here with, with some uh, follow-on reading specifically tied to this. And, there's, and I've also put um, a list of the recordings and musical sources that I'm using so you can go back and listen again either on YouTube or their CD references, which I assume you can just get online and download. So, I, I set myself kind of limits to this one because this, the whole subject of so sources of music in Scotland is too big and too huge for a single lecture. So, so, so I'm going to talk about mostly about these loop manuscripts but of instrumental sources from Scotland in the 17th century. And uh, this, this picture is very interesting. This is, this is the ceiling of a house in Edinburgh from, from right at the beginning of the, of the 17th century, and it's part of a series for the senses, and this is for the sense of hearing. And uh, there's loads of interesting stuff going on here. Um, I love the way the animal is listening. It's very kind of, you know, it's a very animalistic sense. Um, you'll see the harp in the corner, and you'll see the harp is not being played. Okay? And, and this is the whole thing about the harp as a symbol I'm going to go on about in two days' time. Um, but you can see what we've got here. We've got an aristocratic lady, and she's playing a lute, and she's reading from an open book. Okay? And so this, this is kind of an interesting image of what sound is made of. It's, it's made of an aristocrat with their instrument and a, a written page. Okay. And so what I'm going to be trying to do today, so these are the points that I want you to start thinking about and picking up on, is what instruments are being selected, how, how are they relating to textual culture, and who's doing the playing, and who's doing the listening. Okay. And this picture, is, this picture encapsulates all of that because, because you, have the, you have the natural world listening, which I think is very cool. And you have the aristocratic amateur playing, and they're playing the lute, which is the standard international instrument at the time, and they're reading from a book. Okay. This is a... This is, this is, you can get this on the handout list later on and have a look at it. There's, a, there's an interesting thesis from uh, a short while ago where they tried to look at every single 17th century source of Scottish <coughs> instrumental music. So already they're cutting out all the vocal music because it's too much to cope with. But I just put this up so you can scan down and see there's, awful, there's an awful lot of them. They're all manuscripts. There's no, there's no printings of Scottish music or, mu or instrumental music in Scotland before 1700. 
Um, and if you look down the column of instruments, you'll see it's a kind of a quite specific group of instruments. So you have lutes, you have the viols, you have keyboard and violin stuff. That's kind of it. Okay. And what, and what this doesn't show you is, is genres of stuff. I mean, some of the stuff does, like, like ones without names. Like here, you have, you have um, quite a lot of continental music, this, all this viol music. Um, the, the keyboard music is all continental style. Some of them, they, you know, Kinloch's keyboard music, he was a Scottish composer from up in Aberdeenshire, but he's, he's just in the European tradition. And so that's very interesting. And these, these are kind of neglected because people, people always want to focus on Scottish music. So this is another question. What is Scottish music? What is music that's played in Scotland? And, is, and what's the difference between them? Because these are not obvious questions at all. Okay, so we're mostly going to be looking at lute manuscripts. In fact, almost exclusively today because... As you saw, the, the, the stereotyped image of what is sound and what is music is an aristocratic lady playing the lute. And lute music is written in tablature, it's not written in staff notation of this period. And in Scotland, we always use French lute tablature. There's more than one type of lute tablature. But we always use French tablature because of the cultural connection between Scotland and France. So this is a, a 17th century engraving from a French treatise. And I've just put it up here to show you the lute. And, well, this is not actually a lute, this is a mandor, which is a very tiny kind of soprano lute with only four strings. But you'll hear a little bit of that later on. And this is how it works, okay? So the, this instrument has four strings. So you write four horizontal lines and then the four strings. And it has frets, and you touch the frets to, to increase the pitch of the string. Yeah, just like on a guitar, okay? And each fret has a letter. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And so what you do is you write the letter on the line. And so it's like, it's, it's like, it's like music by numbers, OK? So if you look at this score, I have no idea what this music is. I, I never looked. It's, it's going to be some French loop piece that Mersenne has chosen. So, so, the, so at the beginning, the, the very first stack, you have a column. It's A on the top line, so the top string is open. F on the second line. So you press your finger onto the fifth fret on the second string, <coughs> A on the third line, so the third string is open, and nothing on the fourth line, so you don't touch that, so you strum the top three strings. And you have no idea what notes they are, but the instrument speaks the correct chord. Okay, so it really, is, it really is music by numbers, it's painting by numbers. Okay? For, these, for these aristocrats, who are not professional musicians, who are not necessarily musical artistic geniuses, they're just strumming away in their chamber, in, like, like you would play a CD at home. Okay. So this is how this is this is how it works on a technical level. And this is how it works for us, okay? So this is a this is a typical I've chosen this is a typical example of a Scottish seventeenth century music book. And this is a very famous one. This is the Roe Allen <coughs> manuscript. And I can't remember I can't remember anything about Roe Allen. Who he was. Rowland's a place, but you know, the laird of Rowland was, was, was a great nobleman and he had all his noble hobbies like collecting antiquities and writing poetry and playing the lutes, as one does, which is an aristocratic dabbler. And if you're going to play the lutes in the 17th century Scotland, you have to have a book to play from because that's how playing the lute works. You can't just make it up because you're just an amateur. And so, and so you. You can't buy a loot book because there's nothing being printed. You have to make one yourself or have it made for you. So I think he's, he's looking at this out himself in his study. It's the kind of gentleman scholar type thing. And I think, I think he's copying it from other manuscripts he's borrowed. Maybe a loot teacher would come and help him to work things out and give him paper sheets of tunes on and he would copy them into his book. And his book would be a kind of something he would, be, he would show to his friends. He would have it on display in his music room or in his study. So you, you can see there's six lines. So this is for a, this is a standard baroque flute. It's actually got more than six strings. Um, you see that you see on the you see there's letter A below the 
lines, the, the, this is the, this, it's got extra bass strings. So these are the, this is this is a big bass chord. And now, what else can we say about it? It's called Sweet Saint Nicholas. This is a lovely title. And what else can we say about this tune? Nothing really, because this is the big problem with these sources, is that you get a title, a tune, and then you get the next page, and you just go, well, what is this? How, how can we engage with this? How can we understand this text? It's very kind of closed and hidden from us. And uh, this, is a work, this, is, this is a work of scholarship that hasn't really been done very much. Um, so you're just beginning, really, to, to work out what this stuff is. And I was being a bit naughty, because I chose this, because I did, I did know what it was. But you'll find plenty of people who will... Who will hold this up as a Scottish folk tune and you get it on CDs, CDs of historically minded Scottish traditional musicians. But um, would you like to listen? In fact, would you like to see it? I'm sorry that I can't show you this. Are we going to get any sound? You should. How do we make it giant? How can anyone tell me anything about this tune? Anybody have any ideas about it? Um, I don't know. The biggest thing I noticed is that he always picks the strings and never strums. Yeah. But that's not that's normal for Renaissance loop. Yeah, but yeah. Because the tablature every every letter is a single note to be spoken, so there's sometimes when you How can you tell when to um Pluck strings at the same time versus. Well, look when you have letters in a stack. So that's a chord. Did he ever pluck like four strings at a time? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. I guess I'd be wondering um, can you get rhythm out of this? Um, there's, there's little. Oftentimes you get little rhythm markings like this one doesn't have that. But, but you find a tune in another source. And it has the rhythm markings, yeah. Okay, because because this, this is this is actually quite a well known tune. It's uh, it's not normally called Sweet Saint Nicholas. It's normally called On May Revenar, and it's composed by Daniel Batchelor, <coughs> who's a late 16th, early 17th century English lute composer. Okay, so this is a standard piece of Anglo-French lute music. I think a song. I, th I think I think it's a, it's, it's a song, and this is a lute. Sort of version of, of, a, of a song in that Anglo French tradition. There's nothing to do with Scottish music at all. But it's the kind of thing that William Rowe Allen would be playing on his lute because he wants to be a cosmopolitan, continental gentleman. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? I, th I think this is normal for the kind of music that you find in, in the Scottish lute manuscript. Anyway, moving swiftly on, because we, we haven't got all day. Okay, this is an interesting one. This comes out of the Whiting Collection in Dundee. 
Um, so this is, you can see how it works. You've got six lines, so you've got six strings. It's called Montrose Lines. And you think, oh, Montrose, that's a good Scottish name. So perhaps we're going to get some Scottish music. Okay. And at the top right hand side, it says Harp Sharp. Okay. And, and, and this gives music scholars a pause of thought because you go, ah, we recognise that name. That is the name of a viol tuning. You know what a viol is? It's like, it's, it's like a modern <coughs> hybrid of lute and cello. So it's like a cello upright, but it has frets like a lute and six strings. Okay? So, you, so, you, so again, you play it by numbers. Okay? So, the, to the, to the first note, on the fifth string, it's <coughs> open and you play it open. And that's the first, the first thing. Okay? You can retune the strings. That's what harp sharp means. It's a specific instruction to tweak the tuning to make all the strings in octaves and fifths so it has more resonant harp like sound. Okay. So I'll, I'll show you what this one sounds like if I can grapple with the system. Okay, here we go. I'm not quite sure because this tune seems a bit free floating. People refer to it, but nobody seems to have studied it at all. But I think it's connected to a border ballad tune. Okay, but it's a, but it's a very sophisticated setting of it. It's not just a simple playing to the tune. It's got it's got a lot of interesting and subtle movement. So yes, it's more it's more Scottish. It, it fits more with the Scottish aesthetic. You've got the hint of the title, but. It's not straightforward. Okay, it's, this is this is quite a classy setting. Is this tune or arrangement or version? But again, think of how many vial manuscripts there were on the on that list of, of manuscripts. This is quite a common. This is a big part of this aristocratic music division, and the vial is a normal French instrument. You know, there was those French vial manuscripts as well, in the Pangaea manuscripts. So, so we're thinking of this tradition of playing these tunes in a very melancholy, sweet, sophisticated style on the viol as a big part of this aristocratic, amateur music-making tradition. Okay. But you have to think, where did, where did, you get, where did the person who get this tune from? Who made this setting? This is not an amateur setting, this is a, a sophisticated setting of the tune. Okay, okay let's move swiftly on. 
Okay, this is um, it's one of the earlier manuscripts, the Steen manuscripts. You can see this is an amateur manuscript because it's atrociously messy. Okay. But that's okay. He was just doing it for his own amusement. And there can be a little transcription underneath. So, uh, so you can see the rhythm signs in this one very clearly at the top. Yeah, so you just write ordinary notes, and, and F, uh, you, you write. So the first note is a minimum, and that means every that every note afterwards is a minimum until it changes to a crotchet, and then you have a series of crotchets. Yeah. So I've indicated that in my transcription. Anyone got anything to say about this one? <coughs> anything you don't understand, or anything that you do understand, or any other thing? Obviously, why did we guess about? It's called the flowers of the forest. That bottom is the same, right? It's yeah, I, the, the bottom is me. I've, I've written it oh, out so that you can, if you can yeah. read sheet music and you can't read tablature, then you're not completely at sync. Because you can't read either, it's fine. So this is called the flowers of the forest, and that's, that's a well known tune in Scottish tradition today. Okay. It's a song, and it's a tune on the pipes, and it's very beautiful, and there's lots of culture and tradition associated with it. And so this is the earliest version of that too, and people get very excited about this. But I thought it would be fun to look at it and listen to it. So bear with me for two seconds. This is played on the mandor at that time. Second line. So he's making it up because, because as you can see, the, the, we, we only have rhythm and letters here. There, there are symbols in the tablature for decoration for commas and the little little hash signs on the last one. Do you remember, I don't you remember them. All, all those little hash signs. That's that's um, a decoration, a trill or a cut. So this is very decorated, you know, just decorated all over the place. But the one we've just heard, there's none of those signs. But Rob. McKillop, who was playing the mandor, he's worked with all these manuscripts, and so he, he knows the typical places where the ornament would be put, and so he thinks, well, this is a good place to put it in. So I think that's right, because if he played it just straight, it would be a little bit clunk, clunky. But maybe our man's scheme wasn't very good and couldn't do ornaments, so he would have written straight in this book. Or maybe he was fantastic, and he knew exactly how to ornament it, and he thought, well, I don't want to write the ornaments in, because that will fix me. I want to make up new ornaments every single time. How 
And Rob McKillop was also not playing the harmony exactly as written. He was adding in harmony notes and he was changing some of them. Does that mean he's a bad man? <laughs> I don't know, I'm asking you. <laughs> but there's like pentatonic pen notes. Yeah, you can hear it. You can hear it. what you were saying earlier about, about how it has that modal kind of sound. It doesn't have functional harmony, it doesn't have leading notes, it doesn't have cadences. Okay, and so that fits us into, oh yeah, this is more of a stuff it's doing. Yeah? Um, it's interesting because you said that this was a popular pipe piece. It is now. Okay. Yeah. And you can kind of, you can hear the drone, the pedal tone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, harmonically it's, it's a drone bass, it's not yeah. harmony bass. Yeah. Yeah. And then you only get the fifth when you're yeah. at the end. Yeah. And it's not yeah, exactly. And and you kind of have that in the drones anyway. Yeah. Definitely. So that's very interesting. And yet is it, you know, is, can you categorize this as traditional music then? Can you categorize this as folk music? It, it's super literate because you have, to, you have to look at the book when you're playing it. You saw that in the image of <coughs> sense of hearing. <coughs> you wouldn't hear this in a pub session. Played like that. So, and it's, and it's, uh, this is high stages, this is aristocratic stuff scheme of Halliards was a, was a very wealthy landed aristocrat. So you need to think about all these things before you instantly start categorizing. Okay. Okay, here's another one. This is, this is the saddest of all the Scottish manuscripts. Okay, because um, this, this is a Fife manuscript. It was written by Lady Margaret Weems, you know, down the other side of Glen Rothes towards Kirkcaldy. It was Weems Castle on the coast. And she was the young daughter of the house. And she had an older sister. And of course, they learned music because as aristocratic young ladies, you learn French and sewing and horse riding and music. And what music would you learn? To play the lute, of course. In French style, because that was the deal, and poetry and this kind of thing. And so, because she was learning to play the lute, she would write out her tunes in her book. I think she would have lessons, and she would copy them from her teacher. So, she was born in about 1630, and she was writing this in 1643 to four. So she was 13 years old, 14 years old, and she was writing out these. And I think you can see that, that this is a child's handwriting. Okay. And the reason it's so sad is because she got a horrible disease and died. And, and so her, her book is mostly empty. And so it's very poignant to, to look at it in the, in the National Library. And, and it has love poetry and this kind of thing. That you can really see kind of somebody's mind developing as a, in, the, in this learned continental European tradition. And then being cut short, so it's, so it's very poignant and sad. Anyway, I've chosen this one because, th because this one opens up all kinds of questions about categories and genres and origins and that kind of thing. So this is a big tune because it covers two pages. The, the top line on the left-hand page is at the end of a different tune. You can see at the end she's done this sequence of vertical lines. So to cut it off and mark the end. So we begin at the beginning of the second line. Okay? And you can see we have the first chord is a low chord, it's a bottom, it's a low string of the lute, and one and the about a third of the way up, so, so it's so it's set low on the lute, you know, the meaty kind of sound. You can see we've got a double bar line, about four lines down on the left hand page, so this is she started divided into sections, but that's the only section division. It then follows flows all the way through without any other divisions. She's, she's written the tuning. You know, it's in a sharp tuning. It, she gets she runs out of space and it all gets terribly messy down here, but she's trying to write the tight final two notes scribbly down, and then there's the squiggle for the end of the tune. And then above here, here is the title written at the side. Okay? And it says Da Mihi Manum, which is a Latin title, which I think is quite unusual for Scottish. The, the, the tunes in the Scottish manuscripts. <coughs> they mostly have French titles or Scots 
titles or English titles, but something Latin title. Okay. So this is a tune called Da Mihi Manum, which means give me your hand. Okay. And we know this tune because it's alive in Irish tradition nowadays. Okay. And in tradition, it's said to have been composed in the early 17th century by an Irish harper working in Scotland. Okay. There's no contemporary source for this guy even existing, but this is what the later tradition tells us, the, the provenance of this tune. <coughs> and this is the earliest version of this tune by a long way. So, so, so will I play you on the harp? What I'm trying to play here on the half is pretty much exactly her lute setting. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm unlike Rob, who Rob McKillop, who was trying to give a CD presentation rendering of the tune. I'm, I'm trying to stick to what she's got to try and understand what what she's doing. Okay. Anyone you got any comments about that? How would you categorize that? How would you understand this tune? Yeah. It sounds like a song. Okay, it sounds like a song. It's not. Huh? It's no words to associate with it. And it's part of a genre of harp tunes that seem to be deliberately not song tunes. Because the old harp tunes are normally song airs, yeah. But this, is, but this is part of a genre that is absolutely not. But it's interesting that you say that. Okay. Those of you who have been saying, oh yes, this sounds Scottish, or this doesn't, would you say this sounds Scottish or not? Yeah. It's, the tune sounds Scottish, mainly because the use of that profound scale is not very notable. Yeah, it is. But it, it, there, there seems to be, I, I was going to ask when this was written or about when this was, this was popular. 
Okay, well, it was written by Margaret Weems in 1643. It was written into her book. And, and, and all the information we have is on that page, so it can probably be there. But according to later tradition, it was composed sometime after 1600 by this Irish harper working in Scotland. It's, it's interesting because it's different from the harmonies in the previous um, piece we listened to because it, it didn't have that drum like effect. It was a change of sound, very continental um, harmony lines. Okay. So, so it's not drone based, but you say, I wouldn't say it sounds continental because it doesn't have any functional harmony. It doesn't have cadences. Well, there were some interesting chords in there. There's it, oh, there's lots of interesting chords, yeah. Effect. But you doesn't mean that it, that it doesn't have that. Move that kind of contrary movement that you expect to get in functional harmony. It's, it, it, a lot of the a lot of the movement is parallel, <coughs> which is absolutely no no from a continental art music point of view. So, it's, so I mean, my conclusion about this tune is okay. This this is it's not just the tune that comes from the harp; it's the whole package of harmonies and style and everything. This is the this is the old. Gaelic harp idiom. Okay, and this is a very interesting thing that you should be aware of as well, because we've been talking a little bit about, oh, well, this one sounds Scottish, and this one doesn't, but Scotland wasn't a unified cultural area in the 17th century, like it is now. Okay, there were bigger differences between the Gaelic Highlands and the Scots Lowlands than there probably were between the Scots Lowlands and England. So, in terms of just figuring out what is it, is it Scottish music mm -hmm. or not, it seems like we have a lot of relatively vague and, ideas. and modern so, ideas. So, I guess, how would you, like, so every song that Joe asks is like, is it Scottish music or not? I guess my question is, how would you go about, aside from picking up on, say, the pentatonic cues, how would you go about figuring? Oh, I, I, I would find it very easy. I would say it's a stupid question. So, or, or, or a meaningless question. So you're saying it's not worth it? It's I'm, I'm saying it's a category error. Okay. Because a tune like this is much more connected into the Irish, the harp division in Ireland, because Rory Dow was an Irish harper. He learned in Ireland, came to Scotland, worked for uh, West Coast patrons. So, so this tune is much more connected into Irish music than it is connected into East Coast Scots music. And yet the fact that it's from a Fife manuscript is very interesting as well. So, so that there, are, there are many different strands and threads here, okay? And so any kind of simplification like saying, oh yeah, this is a Scottish tune, it's just not kind right. of missing the point. Yeah. Yeah? Like I say, I, I, would, I would always go as far as it's catch the error. Okay? And, it, and it blinds you to the, the subtlety of the interconnections here. And the thing I love especially about this tune is the, is the way that it sits right at the kind of centre of a spider's web of connections and ideas. So, so you, can, you can take this, and what, this is what I would do with my work on the harp. I would take this as an example of the kind of sounds that Rory Dow, an Irish aristocratic, professional, highly learned, <coughs> highly sophisticated composer, would be working with in Ireland and in, and in the west of Scotland in that high art Gaelic oral harp tradition. There's a lot of words that I stuffed in there, but they're all absolutely relevant. Yeah. And yet it also, you can, you can flip the other direction and you, and you can say, this is Lady Margaret Weems, young, cosmopolitan, learning French lute tablature and love poetry, and playing this um, sight reading from her manuscript of writing as part of her studies of French lute music. And so this one tune connects in these different directions. And you, can do a, in, and you can do another thing, which is to say, this is the beginning of a whole trail of oral tradition, that this tune, this tune is still alive in the oral tradition today, mostly in Ireland, but all around the world. And this setting connects into that. So, so that's at least three completely divergent directions that you can go with, this, with something like this. And in each of those directions has many, many, many very subtle angles and aspects to it that, that are unclassifiable by any kind of simplistic modern system. Okay? Anyway, moving swiftly, anybody got any other comments or questions about Dami Himanum? I could talk for all day about it, but we can't. Okay. 
I'm going to skip the next one because it's not interesting enough. Oh, sorry, this, this is, um, if, if you want to take further into Dahimana, in your handouts, there's a four page handout like this where I split up the tablature and transcribe it for you. So if you want to explore this in more detail, there's a YouTube of me playing it, and so you can follow the YouTube and this handout if you wish to. Okay, this will be my final example. So this is the Balcaras loop manuscript, which is also a Fife manuscript, just along the coast of Weems, on the south coast of Fife. It's a huge and very luxurious loop manuscript. And if you want to find out more about it, this is the, this is the edition in two fact volumes, it's facsimile, and it's got a great introduction, and I'm sure it's in the library, isn't it? I'm sure I've seen it up on the shelves, up on end like this. You can see this. So you should definitely get this one out and have a, have a look at it. Okay, so, so there's lots of interesting and unusual things about the Valcaris loop range, which is late, 1695, 1700, maybe 1703, something like that. <coughs> Almost every tune, if you look, the transcription is from that book, if you look at the tune, there's something new that we've not had before. There's two things that are new that we've never had before in any of the other sources I've shown you. Okay, and the most important is <coughs> that it has people's names attached to it. It's, so it's called The Newest Scots Measure, Mr. McLaughlin's Way, by Mr. Beck. Okay? And this is new, because the other ones don't tell you that. So Mr. Beck is the person who, who made this loop and tabulation, or this loop version, and gave it to the aristocratic ladies, uh, to um, Balcadders. And Mr. McLaughlin is an Edinburgh fiddle player. And the fiddle was new at that time. Okay. And, so, and so although this is a lute arrangement, I would say this is a fiddle tune. So I'll play it to you on the fiddle. And you'll have to excuse me because I don't play the fiddle. So it's going to be rubbish. Yeah, go on. Uh, is this the first one that's had a time signature attached as well? Yes, I think you put... Possibly, possibly. You do get time signatures in, the, in other sources, but you know, maybe you're right, maybe it's purely by chance that I chose not to write it. Mm.
how does it compare to the others? It's the strongest sense of the tonic. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
humidity and the dryness in here. You tuned it and to the flat box music because the normal violin is a bit higher than that, so you tuned Well, it's tuned down because it's got strings yeah. and a bit weak, yeah, so, mm -hmm. so it's like a, a note low. But yeah, pitch down is a very arbitrary. And the bow is much more slender and lightweight than a, than a modern bow. So, so the whole thing speaks more, speaks differently. And yeah, and, and, and everything's in first position. There's no shifting, and you just put it you can put it in it wherever you like. But I mean that's normal. If you look in, if you look at 17th century pictures of people playing the violin, this is, this is how they hold it. And uh, there's a there's a there's a wonderful photograph in the School of Scottish Studies archives of one of their 1970s, 60s, or maybe even 50s collectors going to Shetland to collect the music. And they're outside the door of a cottage, and the um, and the Edinburgh lady is standing there like this, posing with the violin. And the, and, the, and, the, and the Shetland woman, and they're dressed almost the same, it's really funny, the Shetland woman is standing like this. <laughs> and I just say, yes, excellent. This, 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 this shows you the different, diff different styles. So, 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 I would say that what I just played there, I mean, I think actually this is quite crude tune by, by these standards, it's, it's a little bit crude, but it sets the scene for the whole of the 18th century in Scottish music. People like James Oswald, they take this idea that you have a Scottish idiom and you use Baroque Italian technical tools to express it on the violin and other instruments like that. So Oswald's work really, really refines this and makes it beautiful. And a lot of that stuff is what we still have today as the, as the most high and beautiful forms of, of Scottish music. And I guess this leads in that, that they, that they self-consciously thought, this is Scottish music. We know what Italian music is, we know what Scottish music is. And you start having these things. And there's, there's a wonderful book in the Whiting Collection that's um, a collection of Scottish and English and Irish airs in sections. And the Scottish airs is this kind of stuff. And the Irish airs are the big Caroline harp tunes. And the English airs are Handel arias. And I love the way that that is the way that they're categorized. These are all the people that they're from different countries. And so that's, that's, for me, that's the kind of the takeaway for the 18th century. At the end of the 18th century, people, people change, they change gears again and they start inventing the concept of folk music and art music. And it was always hardly wrong after that. Okay, because it's complete rubbish, basically. At least, at least this idea of national music has some kind of coherence, even if there's blur, blurry boundaries. But the other, but so, I mean, going back to the 17th century, you, you don't have either. It, this is where the category I come to. It's a mistake to think of folk music and art music. It's a mistake to think of Scottish music and foreign music. In the 17th century, the music is all socially embedded. It's who's doing it and why they're doing it. And everything else doesn't matter. It, Lady Margaret Reeves didn't care who composed Armini Manor, or whether it was Irish, or whether it was Gaelic, or whether it was French. She didn't care. She was a nice tune. She played it at home for herself, improvement in education in the cosmopolitan continental tradition. Does that make sense? Any questions? Or complaints, or comments, or... We should release them. Yep. Thank you very much.